much um, from, you know, you can still have a normal conversation with your kids and your grandkids, even though some of the things that they say you don't quite understand. But <laughs> over many generations, these uh, little changes add up. And since the dawn of human language, which linguists think was somewhere around 100,000 years ago in Africa, this process has been going on um, that one group of people um, lived here, moved here, another group moved here, and at first they had the same language, but it changed a little bit here, and it changed a little bit here, and then a little bit more with the next generation in each place. And at a certain point, uh, when people visited again, they could no longer understand each other. And that was uh, where the first two human languages had come from, two, two human languages, had, the first human language had become two. And that process has been going on for 100,000 years. That's where languages come from. If we look at an example uh, from Europe and Asia, uh, there was a language re that linguists have reconstructed about 10,000 years ago, uh, spoken in what would today be modern day Turkey. And you see on this diagram here that linguists call it Proto Indo European, meaning the first Indo European language. And that split through this process. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Could you make that bigger? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm Cheryl. And I interrupt sure. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're welcome. So you see that the first language, uh, two groups separated and they were changing a little bit in each place and that turned into two languages we call A and B. And then over time that emerged into all these little changes added up to become all the modern European languages like Greek, Armenian. Indo-Iranian is actually a bunch of different languages spoken in Northern India, Alpha Slavic, Germanic, and Germanic includes English. So you see how one language becomes many through these periods of little changes over time. That family is called the Indo-European family, and English is one of, the, one of those. It's 584 modern languages. Linguists, as we look at the languages of Southern BC, um, uh, we can see that um, somewhere around 10,000, 13,000 years ago, spoken but right in this area, there was a language um, that we call Proto-Salish. And Proto just means first, so it would have been the first Salish language. And over generations, these slow periods of intergenerational changes, that evolved over a period of 10,000 years into, you could call them sister languages. They're different languages. So you have Squamish, spoken in Squamish in Vancouver, Halkamalan, spoken, I'll talk a little bit about the full territory for that. Little bit in the interior, Okanagan, um, in the interior, Bellacula, the left north, and uh, 20 odd other languages. That's what the Salish family is, is a group of 23 languages spoken in southern BC, all descended from this same original language through this process of slow intergenerational change. You can see there's a, we don't need to go into details here, but there's a diagram of all the front centers, of all the modern centers languages. And there you see the uh, geographical territory in which it's spoken. When we look at the modern Salish languages, if you compare them, because they all come from the same original language, just as in English you could compare German and Dutch, uh, and you'll see a lot of similarities in the words because they come from the same original language. The same is true with Salish. So if we look at the word for I in Halkamalan, it's Kalung, Squamish, it's Kalung, and the Shootsi, it's Kalung. You can see that uh, they, uh, those you're seeing traces have evolved in slightly different directions uh, from the same original uh, Proto Salish language. And you see that with the word for friend, Siaya, Siaya, and Siaya. So that was just to be clear about when we talk about Salish, we're not talking about a language, we're talking about a group of 23 modern languages that all descend from the same ancient language through this slow period of intergenerational change, and they all became the same language. So a Squamish speaker can't understand how a male speaker or an Okanagan speaker uh, just without having studied the language. Now I want to talk about uh, what because I, I, I want to talk about it a little bit because it's a little bit confusing, I think, for us uh, Kulitam. Um, this language, which the linguists have given it this name, Help Malum, and we spell it with a K. Um, but it's, it's a little bit of a complicated story. I have to start by defining the term dialect. A dialect 
is any variety of a language. When I talk about a dialect, I just mean it's that variety of a language. Sometimes people use it in this sense. Linguists wouldn't, but some people use it in the sense of he's not really speaking a language, he's speaking a dialect. That, to a linguist, that doesn't make any sense. It's because everybody speaks some variety of a language. So all varieties count as dialects. The Queen speaks a dialect of English, too. Hers is called RP. Now, when we talk about two different dialects, to a linguist, we would say you're speaking two different dialects of one language when you can understand each other, even though it's a little bit different. So if I speak to somebody from Australia, that actually the vowels are a little bit different and some of the words are a little bit different, but we can have a conversation and pretty much understand each other. You can take two systems uh, that might be similar to each other, but if we can't understand each other, this would be the case with me with English and German. If I need a German speaker or a Dutch speaker, our languages are actually quite similar. They're historically connected, but we can't understand each other. So that's, for a linguist, that's where we draw the boundary. We say these two systems are dialects of one language. They're varieties of the same language because the speakers can understand each other. These two other groups are different languages, even though they might be similar, because they can understand each other. Sometimes social factors uh, will kind of override that, like Chinese is actually, from a linguist perspective, would actually be 12 languages, but they want it to be one language, so okay, fine. Now, when we talk about how to mail it, we're talking about one of the languages in the uh, Salish family, so descended from this ancient Proto-Salish language. It's not mutually intelligible with Squamish or Lilloet, but how to mail it itself has three different varieties. The confusing thing is they don't have an English name that fits in all the three different uh, varieties because in each different place, the name of the language is a little bit different. So on the island around Nanaimo, uh, they have they refer to the system as Halkmitnam. Uh, Downriver at Musqueam and Sawasan, they refer to it as Halkmitnam. And here, upriver, I uh, refer to it as Halkmalem, sometimes called upriver Halkmalem or Stolo Halkmalem. Now, from a linguist point of view, not to tell anybody you know, what, how to organize your society, but from a linguist point of view, we would say that those are three varieties of one language. We would call them three dialects of one language. And we do that because, uh, my, from every elder that I've spoken to, they said, if I meet somebody from the island, I can have a conversation with them. And you can tell they're from the island, but yeah, we can talk to each other. So when that's what we would say about um, Halkamela is that it's this language with these three different varieties. Now, it's more complicated than that because even within the upriver variety, I think there's a, a, probably at least 17 different dialects uh, spoken here. So these are very broad divisions of it, but that's, those, those are the major divisions. So if you hear somebody talking about this language, Halkamalum, that's what they're talking about, is these three different varieties. They're different uh, political units, and they each have a different writing system, and the systems are quite different. The sound systems are a little bit different from each one, but because they're mutually intelligible, we call them all health mail, even though the name of the language is different in the three different varieties. See the um, distribution of, of uh, what we call in English health mail. There's upriver is the yellow, that's uh, health mail. Uh, Downriver is the orange, and island is the purple. And you see, I've highlighted the differences between the names. So that obviously, the English name Halk Malum is adapted from the upper Halk Malum. So that was to give you a little bit of background. Um, now I want to talk about some sounds and some words um, and connect those to stories in Halk Malum. Just to give you some examples of um, some, just some things that we found um, as we were documenting the language with the elders. The first sound I want to talk about is N, as in, uh, it's an English sound, so we can all make it. Um, and the words I have for the sound are Nilla, which means child, and Halkmalum, which means Halkmalum. It's an upper pronunciation of the name of the language. And you're like, okay, the sound is N, so why did we pick Nilla and Halkmalum? So where's the N? And this is my story. Most Salish languages have an N. They have an N and they have an L. The other dialects, the other major varieties of health mail also have an N. So it must be they have an N and the Nimo they have an N. Um, but something happened upriver. One of these gradual changes that happens in, in all languages, and the particular one that happened upriver, um, I believe the boundary was around Katsi. At a certain point, and it wasn't that long ago, we don't think, maybe in the last century or so, uh, the upper speakers shifted all their N's into L's. 
So they went through their entire vocabulary. It wasn't conscious, it was just sort of a, you know, the, the accent just emerged. But all the ends became L's. So if we look at the word for child, if you uh, go to the island, it would be something like mana in Squamish. It's a different language, but it would be something like mana. It would have an N. Uh, but because upriver N became L, the upriver word for child is Mila. And that's one of the major distinguishing features that you can tell, oh, this person is from the island, or this person is from downriver, versus this person is upriver, is the upriver speakers do not have N, except in a few place names, and I think maybe in some, uh, some uh, traditional practices. Uh, but in the ordinary language, all the Ns have become Ls. According to the dictionary developed by Tokadiksa and Brent Galloway, is from a camel, uh, which in English is Nicoman Island near Daroche. I guess I, I, just not far from here. Uh, you see that the Nicoman Island uh, reflecting um, that uh, they, if not that long ago, in the older form of, of Salish, it would have had Ns, but those Ns became L, so it would have been something like a Nicaman becoming the camel. Now, in Halkamalam, uh, when you have a verb in the ongoing action, you have um, an HA prefix uh, for certain verbs, especially if they begin with an L or an N. So you'll have this prefix HA indicates an ongoing action, and UM is kind of a general verb ending. So you, you take HA and UM and you put them on the camel, and you get, it would have been originally something like halak, halak malam like that, and then that got changed into Hal Kamelon. So it looks like the word origin of it is something like going to Nekoma. So it indicates probably that uh, this would have been the original place where the language was spoken. My next two sounds, I want to talk about club and club. Let's make club. Everybody um, makes club. You just say club. <laughs> Now I want you to, I know that many of you speak the language, so I don't <laughs> For those of you who don't, um, uh, to make this L, it's spelled with an LH, but it's a single sound, it's not two sounds. It's like an L, uh, but you make it hissy like a snake. So your tongue is in the same position, but you have no white writing in your throat, and you make it sort of hissy. So it sounds, instead of full, it becomes, try it. It's not that hard. <laughs> It's actually a sound in many languages of the world. Um, for example, in Welsh, um, the name Lloyd is from Welsh, and it's, it's spelled with two L's because in Welsh they spell L. The sound is spelled L L, so Lloyd should actually be Floyd. Um, okay. So that's so that's <laughs> now I want to make a cue. Now in English. We have a lot of words that are spelled with Q, uh, but it's just the same as a K. It's just a spelling, a spelling convention that we sometimes spell our K sound with a Q. Mm -hmm. When you hear how come Alan sounds, if you're, if you're just starting the language, you hear a Q, you, you think it's just a K, and you tend to just say a K, but it's actually quite a different sound. Um, if you look inside your mouth, you see, the, you see that thing that's dangling in the back here, that's hanging down? And does it? <laughs> That's your you So when you make a K, you kind of hit at the root of the mouth forward to the back. When you make a Q, you need to pull your, your tongue, the back of your tongue, right back to your uvula. It's actually quite a bit further back in the mouth. Let me open up a video here. <laughs> So now you can all try to try it. And, and you know, you're not saying a K, you're saying a P, right? So you're trying to pull your tongue to the So, as of course many of you know, this is uh, the uh, First Nations name for uh, Mount Xi'an. And this is dear to my heart because Cleet Lake was a woman. I don't, I don't want to tell the story, but the, you know, the story is public, so uh, just to give you the highlights. Uh, Cleet Lake was married to Mount Baker. And she left him. My wife left me last year, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that when I see Mount Shia. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
were three daughters uh, and a dog, and uh, they were transformed into, into a mountain. And you see the shape of the dog and the three daughters and, uh, and sweet uh, in the mountain. So now, uh, if you want to see Mount Jim, uh, that's, uh, that's the first thing you can for it. The next sound I want to talk about, and then I have to have a, have a word for this. Um, it's spelled with an X, and it's got an underline, uh, underline on the X. That underline is actually important. Sometimes it gets lost. It's a tricky one in, in when people are transcribing and stuff. Uh, but the X is, the underline is quite significant. Uh, it indicates, they call it a hard X. It indicates uh, that your tongue is pulled back to your uvula again. It's in the same position as for a Q. Uh, but instead of going like huh to stop it for a second, you make it continuous with friction. And it sounds like uh, huh. Let me, um, I have a, not an ultrasound video, but a diagram of this. <laughs> <laughs> the vowel sounds like ha, uh, like ha, is to straddle something. Ha, ha. The B is not supposed to be underlined there. Um, often to indicate an ongoing action in the language, depending on the, on the form of the verb, uh, you get partial doubling. So ha becomes ha, ha. And that indicates you go from straddle something to straddling something. So ha, ha is straddling something. And the L, according to the dictionary, the L, uh, you get a L, and it's indicating something like the place, or the place where you're always. So L, K, K, is indicating a place where you're always straddling something. And uh, the story I learned from the, from reading the dictionary is L, K, K, right here and here. Uh, it used to, used to be a crossing there, I guess it's been gone for many years, but it used to be a, a log crossing there, and it was a slippery big log, and people used to be walking across it, and they would slip and fall, and they would be straddling <laughs> the log, and uh, they would slip. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the apostrophe one is, let's call it a bottle stop. You can actually all make it because we do it in English even though we don't write it. Everybody say, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Do you feel when you do that, there's a catch in your throat? You're closing your, your, vocal, cords, your vocal cords for a second there. And that, that's, that's all that sound is. Except in English, we just do it kind of as a reflex when the word begins with a vowel. Uh, but in help mail, it's a regular sound. So you have a word like food. The word is sa-ethical. The second sound there is the catch of the throat. Um, so you can all make that one if you just say, uh-oh. Um, but the trickier sound, um, and I don't think, if, if, if you haven't studied the language, I don't think you will be able to make it right away, but um, I'll just go over how you make it. It's a T, uh, but it's pop. And the way you pop it, But the, what's also happening 
is in his throat. You see, he closes his throat. That's making the that's making the catch in the throat sound. And he he pushes up his whole voice box. Now, this is this sound doesn't occur in, in I don't think in any European languages. It's, it's not uncommon around the world languages, but and it's used in all the Salish languages. What's happening there is I make a T. I'm closing, at, you know, putting the tip of my tongue up. That stops the air. I stop the air in my throat. Then I push up my whole voice box. The air is compressed by pushing up my voice box. And then when I release it, it comes out as a pop. Um, it, it, to learn how to make it, you, you're going to do a, se a series of ta uh, ta uh, ta uh, ta until you get the sequence right. But once you can do it, um, it sounds like this, and I happen to have a very prominent Adam's apple, which is normally very <laughs> gross, but it works for you. <laughs> um, I'm going to say the sound with the pop T, and I think you'll be able to see my voice box uh, going up and down as I do the sound. So. Can you see it moving down? And for some reason, my head goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's the pop T. There's I won't go through it, but there's also a pop version of P and a pop version of K and a pop version of the Q. So they have a whole series of these pop sounds. Then was called the injectors. Um the, the word and my phrase for this one, uh, the word is feeling, which is the same. Then we talked briefly about how if you have a verb and you double the first uh, consonant and vowel, uh, that indicates an ongoing action. So tefillin is the same, tefillin is singing. And then I just throw in another word which is easy to say, spat, which is a black bear. And this lets me say, tefillin is spat. <laughs> my next uh, sound, and I think this is, this is my last sound and my last uh, story, uh, is the difference between the hard X, which we talked about, is the underlying one where you pull back to your uvula. That's H. There's also a soft X, which is also not a sound in English. It sounds a little bit like a SH, the SH, but the position is not quite the same. Uh, the soft X, the un non underlying X, it's not that hard to make. Uh, what you're doing is you bring the um, body of your tongue, not, not, not right back to the uvula, but just up towards the, the roof of the mouth. So it sounds like, can we try that? So it's very, it's not, it's, it's that, the hard one, the underlying one would be, and the, the soft one is like this. There's a similar sound to this in uh, many languages, in Chinese, but, but not in English. So my word, um, here is Siolakwa, which means elder. Um, the plural formation in Halkamerlum is a little bit complicated. Uh, sometimes it's done with some doubling, uh, sometimes they don't use a plural, special plural form, and sometimes you have a, a, like an L or an EL uh, inserted into the word. Uh, so the plural for elders is, uh, one of the plural forms is Siolakwa. Um, when somebody is deceased, uh, you put an uth or an at on the end. So to talk about the ancestors, the deceased elders, you would talk about Siljol and Kwao. And um, so now I'm just going to use the words here because um, all of what I showed you here and, and, and like a whole bunch more stuff. It's just, it's just so much stuff in the language that you could get and you could spend your lifetime as, as as uh, 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 I hope uh, people will, just exploring this language and just going on a journey through it. Um, 
all the honor for the fact that people are going to be able to do that goes to the Siliyala Quad, to, I would say their name, Sammy Tilliot, who's here tonight, um, Seth Lequat, uh, who's passed away, I worked with for many years, Yamala, uh, Kuyalama, uh, Salisa Wood, and uh, all the Siliyala Quad who work to save their language for the children of tomorrow. It's, it's an honor for me to be here, uh, but the honor all goes to them. So I don't know the history of I don't know the history of that. Uh, at Scholar Shuli, we did some more work um, uh, on the on the phonemes and, and getting more into these diagrams that some of the animated diagrams that we we put on there that was worked through Scholar Shuli and, and UBC. Mm -hmm. And of course, and, and the great thing now, you know, I, I showed you the ultrasound video uh, for Arabic uh, last year. Sam Utiliot. Uh, a group of us from UBC came out and we recorded her, and we, we, I couldn't show them today because they're still being edited, but uh, hopefully uh, in some time, maybe next year, we'll have those edited, uh, and you'll be able to see uh, her tongue movement in, in, in the same way. Okay. Now you say that uh, if, you're, if you're able to master yeah, the, the, the chart, it'll make it a lot easier for you to learn the language. Yeah, and it's important. I think a lot of times uh, what happens is people are, are saying the language and they'll just say a K because they don't know that it's not that it's different from a K. It's, for the hero Q, I just sound like a K, so I'll just say a K or uh, some things like that. Yeah. But home? And it's so honored to have them. And my sister Fern is teaching Alkamina. And I want to stress to all the young people I hope you really understand how important it is to move forward with our language. And I'm not a very good student myself, so I'm being really humble here and sharing with everybody that there is so uh, precious moments that go by. And I have the teachers at my home. And I want you to know that. The grants that we're getting now from the government, that our people need to access them the best way possible. And just recently, First People's Cultural Council, I'm on that committee as a board member. And I want you all to know that hearing the, the hardship that trying to get people out to the languages. But I'm going to look at the way Stephen Point looks at them when he shared with us. Even if one person comes, that person represents thousands of people. So I just wanted to uh, thank my aunties, Auntie Barbara, Auntie Helen, my cousin Mary, my sister Fern, and my friend Joe was here, Clayton, he takes the class. I'm telling you my whole life story. <laughs> But I, I, I want to say I'm so proud that you're sharing what you're sharing. It means a lot. 
And I hear those stories of um, losses of our elders. Elizabeth, you're golden. And my aunties are golden. My sister's golden. Because they're spoiled with learning what you taught them and what the other teachers taught them. But don't look at it as a roadblock, and I think that's what I'm doing with myself, is a roadblock. And I want to tell myself, and I want you to tell me, just go. Just go. And there's more apps now, more tapes, more books, more people trying to find a way to reach the goal. And I'm lucky to be on that board to see that happen. But we are in desperate times. And we need to, all our young people, you need to please be strong for us. Walk forward. Please. That's all I ask of you. And thank you for allowing me to speak. And Dr. Strang, keep up your good work. You're very young yet. <laughs> and I think are young in teaching their, and their elders, you have a long ways to go yet. <laughs> and I know that whoever's teachers in here, you have a lot of work to do, and our future teachers as well. All our relations, everybody, thank you for listening. Um, it was the language translation contest, I think it was at, uh, at Seabrook, and they said, we want you to come be a judge at the contest, so I was like, okay, I do that every year, right? And uh, then before the contest started, so by the way, uh, we're going to give you a name. So, okay. Um, uh, I was deeply honored. And my name, I think it was, was it was a Kolak who, uh, who? Um, And the name is, um, uh, Iwas is uh, to teach, and Field is to weave, and uh, the name is Iwas Field. I, I love it so much. And the translation is uh, Weaver of the Language. Yes. And I forgot to use my name. <laughs> um, my name is Elaine Malloway. I just wanted to give you a lesson on my name. Um, because there's so many intermarriages with, between tribes. And I know that our language has no ends. And um, so one of my ancestors was working on a, a boat on the river. And he had a, a name, but they couldn't say his name. So they said, well, we're going to call you Manuel. And, um, but since we have no ends, the way we said it was Malawa, and that became our last name. That became our last name. So if you go to our graveyard, there's Malawas, but when my grandmother got with my grandfather, she put the Y on the end, so it changed to Malaway. And so with all those intermarriages with, um, you know, like ones from the island will come over this way, or Douglas, all the words are changing because um, somebody was pointing out that when you go up to Chehalis, they're using the ends or whatever. So all our words are getting mixed up. And so um, I'll hear my coworkers say something in her language, and I kind of understand her, but I know it's you know her language. But with us, it's like, um, I can't go to the island and understand what they're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to give you a, um, I try to teach um, all our younger ones the history of our name because um, they always said that um, that's how we ended up with um, the first names as last names. We carried the name of our ancestors and it became our last name. That's why you have Sounds and Bobs and Dicks. And, you know, it's all, all the, the names of the, their fathers or their grandfathers carried, and that's how the history of our names. 
but I, I love the history of our name. So. <coughs> Good work. Uh, please join us now for a reception and have a